That nickel, nickel nine. Yeah. Uh, five nine J. Uh, uh, let me speak my mind up. Uh, uh, it's just me keeping it real. Uh huh. Keeping it one hundred. Let's go. Yeah. Hey yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. One of my subscribers did ask me to talk about the Menendez brothers, Eric and Lyle. And like I said, diversifying my catalog, trying something new, trying something different. And I have an opinion on this particular case. But, you know, sometimes when I see a lot of people already do videos about it that are stuck in the same genre as myself, I kind of avoid those kind of situations and those conversations. But I think it's very unfair because I know a lot of my subscribers do want to hear my perspective, my point of view in regards to certain situations. And this happens to be one of them. So let's get right into the video. So these brothers got charged. What was it like in the 80s, bro? Like 89? There were big public figures. Public figures on what they did in Beverly Hills to their parents. Now, look, I know about this situation. I'm not very too familiar with the cases, so to speak. But in all essence... You know, I was locked up with one of them. I don't remember which one because I didn't really see the dude like on the yard myself, but he was on the same yard as me in Kern Valley. Everybody said that he was on the yard. Everybody said they used to see him go to visit on the yard, but I personally didn't see him on the yard, but it was a long time ago. I want to say it was Kern Valley. I just don't know which brother it was. So, you know, like I said, I don't know which brother it was. I could have easily made up a story about the dude and Nobody could really criticize me or, you know, do a background check on me, so to speak. But like I said, we were on the same yard. Don't know which one it was. The only thing I remember they hear him saying is that they had a, uh, uh, you know, a punk in the cell and he would go to visits with hickeys. But I, like I said, I didn't see that. That was like the only rumor I heard about the guy. So anyways, you got two young brothers that took the lives of their parents. During that whole court proceeding, the first trial, that was actually a mistrial where they had to go to court again a second time to get convicted and receive life without the possibility of parole. When you get a mistrial, that just goes to show you they weren't able to convince the jury unanimously, a unanimous vote, that they were guilty of what they were being accused of. But 12 shotgun shells were placed into the parents. 12. Somewhat of an overkill, if you ask me. Now, mind you, I've seen enemies kill enemies, couple bullets. You know, they shoot seven, three hit the victim, victim dies. We're talking about two kids that really went back home to their parents. I can't remember if they were sleeping or not in bed and shot their parents both with 12 gauge shotguns multiple times. Now with a 12 gauge shotgun and that kind of slug or them kind of rounds, they said it was over a dozen rounds. You shoot somebody that's laying there helpless. That's a merciless act. It's a horrible act on the basis that they shot somebody with a 12 gauge shotgun so you know getting shot with a 12 gauge shotgun the person's gonna die unless they have immediate help there's ambulance there there's a medic there they get to the hospital fast enough those are fatal wounds mortal wounds that can really kill somebody especially at point blank range like they killed their parents point blank range overkill if you ask me so their whole trial and for the last past few decades they've been basing these allegations and what they've been accused of and been sentenced and received life without the possibility of parole was that they were sexually assaulted by their father. They were sexually abused, emotionally abused, physically abused by parents. Now, that's something that I can't sit here and make fun of or, or downplay and be like, oh, bro, everybody uses that excuse because it happens. There's a lot of kids that suffer from that every day that don't get acknowledged, that don't have the ability to call cops, that have to go through it years before they either retaliate or they get out of a situation and start the healing process and really try to recover from those actions, that kind of past experience of being beat by your parents. That's probably why the laws are the way they are now when people are so anti-discipline because everybody's interpretation of physical discipline on a child is very different. These kids were in their teenage years, but they accused their parents of allowing this to happen. Moreover, the father, you know, sexually abusing them for years. See, none of us that ever been sexually abused know what that's like, knows what it does to the head. We'd have to talk to people and victims of them kind of situations and that kind of misbehavior being done to them by others to really grasp an understanding because every sexually assaulted victim is different. They cope with it different. They think about it different. They relive it differently. It's just something that's, you know, a lot of people should be coming forward and not being afraid to really talk about. 
Because there's a community of people, there's a lot of people in this world that suffer from that, have experienced that sexual assault and have to live through that, have to learn to live with that, are forced to live with that every day of their lives. So it makes it hard because, like I said, I could have easily said, man, that was just a illogical excuse that they needed as a defense to really combat, you know, killing their parents, being accused of killing their parents. The, the harsh reality of it is their parents were dead, killed by shotguns. They were able to admit that they killed their parents with shotguns, right? But they came up with the argument that is because they were sexually assaulted. And if I'm not mistaken, I didn't even watch the Netflix uh, documentary series. So I'm basing this on just articles that I read and what I'm familiar with when it comes to this case. I didn't feel like I needed to watch a documentary to re-illustrate what took place and get a basis of understanding of what really took place and do I believe it or not? Do I think they're still guilty or not? Because there was a jury of 12 people that were able to com be convinced unanimously to convict these guys and charge them with the verdict of guilty and get these guys life without the possibility of parole because of what they did to their parents. That's what the judicial system is really entitled to, to do and what it's there for. You're picking 12 people, however the jury was picked, 12 people from different walks of life with different ways of thinking, with different abilities to think for themselves and come up with their own analysis and their own judgment and their own verdict to come together in a unanimous vote and find these guys guilty. We're talking about 12 different people that all had their own ways of finding these guys guilty. I mean, if we're going to sit here and say, all right, that 12 jurors found them guilty for whatever reason, but in accordance to decades of rehabilitation and redemption and a journey of life that they went through, and in accordance to Gavin Newsom's new laws that allow them to be eligible for parole, let's relook the case over. That's what trips me out about these new laws. These new laws that are taking place and coming into effect, they're giving a lot of people with life, life without the possibility of parole, doing 25 to life. Oftentimes, most of them are going to be murderers. The law is giving these guys an opportunity to say, you know what, hey, after 25 years, overlook my case and see if I'm just as guilty now as I was back then. That's how I see it. Now, I'm not against people getting an opportunity of coming home and, you know, enjoying the life that I've been able to establish for myself, you know, taking care of my kids and, you know, living a good life, getting a job and rehabilitating from the street aspect, not the prison aspect. But some of these laws, you know, some people take as a joke. There's a lot of people argue about these laws all the time. A lot of people didn't like that Gavin Newsom allowed these laws to be passed to give people that committed murder an opportunity to have their case reviewed again go up in front of a judge and submit new case factors and different arguments and different legal defenses and say, you know what? I did 25 years. I'm a changed man. I did 25 years. I'm a changed man. I rehabilitated. Plus, I'm still continuing to say that I'm not guilty or I'm not as guilty as you may seem when I was initially convicted of. I'm not as guilty as I was before. Because that's what this new law really tells me. Is you're giving the people an opportunity to get their case reviewed for them to say I'm as guilty as I was before, but just not as guilty because I changed and because I made a difference with my life and because I have made a difference in my way of thinking and because I choose to say now, but I didn't do, do it back then, to say that I regret the crimes that I committed and the actions that I've done and how I took another person's life. That's what those laws are really doing is giving people the opportunity to get another chance when in reality, the system has been designed to put people like this away for a very long time. Now, am I saying that the Menendez brothers deserve a chance? I'm not a lawmaker. I'm not the one that passed the law. I'm not the one that drafted the law. And I'm not one of the ones that advocated for those laws in the first place because I was in the prison system. I had nothing to do with that. That was people that voted for that law. So you really got to shift blame or, you know, criticize or critique others that really voted for these laws to give opportunities like this to offenders like this the opportunity to come home again because say if they do come home the judge reviews it and his new uh governor that's going to be replacing gavin newsom say they review they review the case factors and they go through with it yeah man there's 15 boxes of new evidence that wasn't submitted in the last trial new evidence to indicate and validate that these kids were sexually assaulted physically abused and emotionally abused emotionally damaged to the point that they retaliated and killed their parents and then went on a spending spree with their credit cards and living a luxurious life, that there's case factors that should give these dudes and grant these dudes an opportunity to be free again. 
because we've been doing it with every person in prison that's doing life in prison that's went in there for murder or off the three strikes law whatever it is that got them life in prison if we're giving them men the same chance to come home let's give these kids the same chance to come home and let's hear their factors let's hear what they have to present for themselves let's check out this 15 boxes and i'm going to emphasize the 15 boxes 15 boxes of newfound evidence that will prove that they were sexually assaulted, molested, or the R word, physically abused. Because if, if, I, if I recall correctly, I thought there was laws for that. Isn't it called a crime of passion? You know, if a, if a woman was to get, you know, sexually assaulted, R-A-P-E, and it should retaliate, like the movie uh, I Spit on Your Grave, one, two, and three, and she decides to retaliate and kill the, the perpetrator, would it be a crime of passion? Isn't there laws like that? In accordance to domestic violence cases, if a woman was to get beat on by her own man to the point she retaliates and takes his life for because she was just tired of getting beat on and she was defenseless and helpless till she finally got a defense, which is a weapon and took the man's life or the man took the woman's life. Isn't there laws that help with those kind of cases to where you won't get an extensive amount of time being added to you like a life prison sentence? They'll get like 10, 20 years, maybe 10 years as a involuntary manslaughter or manslaughter and a plea deal. Why didn't they get that? That's what I was thinking of when I was seeing in, uh, when the, when everybody was talking about the new Netflix series and they're going to have a case review. Like Back then, it, that same allegation, them same charges was the crime of passion. If, in fact, these kids killed their parents on the basis of, you know, they were being assaulted all their lives and they finally were fed up with it. Isn't there a crime of passion? Isn't there a law that would have protect them because of what they went through as long as they proved that? Obviously, it didn't help them. Because a jury of 12 people convicted these guys and gave them life without the possibility of parole. Now, I'm all for equal opportunity. So if they do get granted the opportunity to be eligible for parole and they do get paroled and the judge allows it and the governor allows it, then that's that's in accordance to laws that are in effect. I can't say, hey, man, I still see that they're guilty and I don't believe them and they need to stay in jail for the rest of their lives. I can't say that. Other people can I won't share my opinion in accordance to that, just on my personal opinion. I, what I do say is this, if they get eligible for parole, this crime and this new Netflix series just re-highlighted everything that they did in Beverly Hills. It's people like that with these high profile cases being granted the opportunity to parole. Dude, there, so much more money is going to get thrown at them. So much interviews are going to be thrown at them. These guys are going to take what they did a crime that they committed against their parents and they're going to make a profit from it. Everybody's going to want to interview them. Everybody's going to want to talk about them. Everybody's going to want to chase them around with cameras and see what they're up to, what they're doing, how they're living, how they're adjusting to society after 30, 40 years. They're going to be in the spotlight and they're going to be talked about. So all we're going to be doing in today's society of social media and, and influencers and content creators and bloggers and podcasters we're just going to we're going to forget about the murder. We're going to talk about the murder, but the murder on their parents isn't going to be as important as opposed to what they're up to. How do they feel about being home? Do they regret it? The spotlight's going to be on them and they're going to get rich like any other person. That is my personal opinion and the only personal opinion that I want to elaborate on in accordance to this case right here. But you guys let me know what you guys think in the comment section because I do understand that there's going to be differences of opinion in regards to they be let out. Do you guys believe them? Or is it all fraudulent? Did they really just kill their parents just to kill their parents? What do you guys think about the law? What do you guys think about the new governor's agenda to say before they even get eligible for parole? He wants to review the case and make sure before he grants any clemency or any grants them anything to be eligible for parole. In accordance to this new law, he wants to sit down with a personal team, a person, a personal administration to say, you know what, we're going to go over this our damn selves before we allow it to see a judge's eyes. You guys let me know what you guys think in the comment section. So with that being said, like I always say, is one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.